This week on The Most Notorious Podcast, a story of a turn of the 19th century Australian convict who escapes his captors, heads into the wilderness, and isn't heard from again for over 30 years. So he was found by the Aboriginal people. I think it was three women found him half dead on the banks of a river with the spear of a, of a, of a warrior they knew. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Most Notorious Podcast. I'm Eric Rivenis. Great to have you here with me. Hope you're doing well in these difficult times. I am so pleased to have as my guest today, Adam Courtney. He is a Sydney-based writer and journalist with a long career in the UK and Australia. He is also an Australian historian and has written five books. His latest is called The Ghost and the Bounty Hunter, and it is the subject of this week's episode. Thank you so much for agreeing to spend some time with me. Oh, thank, thank you very much for having me on, Eric. Absolutely. So, first question, where did you get the inspiration to write this book? Well, I was told about this. This We had this expression in Australia called, you've got Buckley's. And what it means is, you've got no chance whatsoever. And it's it's gone through, it's been a, an expression we've had in the country for about, 150 years, and no one is quite sure where it comes from, but people believe it comes from this man, William Buckley. So a friend of mine said he saw an art exhibition about William Buckley. Now, William Buckley was a convict who came to Australia from Cheshire in England, and he he came as a convict in 1803, but they abandoned that particular settlement. But before they abandoned it, he ran away. And now the thing about Buckley was he was six foot five, highly athletic, a really huge, strong bloke. And we think the expression, you've got Buckley's, comes from the fact that Buckley survived in the wilderness, whereas nobody else did in those days. And he survived for about three or four months after having escaped from the, the, the initial settlement. And we a, a, and eventually uh, was picked up half dead by Aboriginal people in, in the Port Phillip area, which is where Melbourne is now in the southern part of Australia. And so we got this expression, you've got Buckley's. And I was just interested, how did we get this expression? And, and then I was, I found a little bit more about the, about the, the, about Buckley himself. I thought this must be a story that we've got to tell. I mean, here's a white guy among Aborigines. It's a big thing here in Australia about reconciliation uh, with our native people. Here's a story about conciliation back in 1803. So I th- thought it had relevance with today. Yeah. So let's just start with William Buckley himself. What do we know about his early life in England and how he found himself in Australia? Yeah, well, you know, you probably know that uh, around about the uh, 1760s onwards, Britain wanted to get rid of all of its, what they would call their riffraff, the the people, anyone who stole a loaf of bread, anyone who did the slightest misdemeanour was uh, sent down to the colonies from about 1780, actually, 1780 onwards, because they simply wanted to, the prisons were being too crowded, uh, the, the, the cities, because it was the Industrial Revolution, were getting too crowded, so they tried to remove, as it were, all their, basically the, the, the lower class, the, the poor um, and dispossessed. So they found us Australia, and Buckley was one of those who came from a very poor little town in Cheshire, in central England, called Martin. Uh, and he... What happened to him is his family were dispossessed of their land because by the 1780s and early 1790s, there was a, there was a war with France. So the, the government needed his land, and so they just took it. It's a bit, of a, it's a bit like the Grapes of Wrath situation that you have in, in uh, America where people just went off the land because it was just taken from them, and, and they had to leave. So he was destined to, for a sort of life of crime. He became an apprentice bricklayer, but we think he was a bit... You know, he did a little bit of uh, criminal activity as well. This is what happened to dispossessed people of, of that time. He actually went into the army, fought against Napoleon in Holland in the 1790s, and came back to his came back to England and fell in with the wrong crowd. And he was caught um, 
uh, fencing, I think it was, fencing or selling uh, Irish cloth. What exactly Irish cloth is, it's, it was very valuable. Um, and he was uh, sentenced to, to, sentenced to, uh, to be hanged. Uh, but they commuted that because they wanted to send all these people down to the colonies. And before he knew, know, knew it, by the age of 22, he was uh, found himself on the southern coast of Australia in a new colony uh, that was just starting out in late 1803. So tell us what life would have been like in a convict colony in Australia in the late 1700s, early 1800s. Yeah, it would have been it would have been very basic. You know, it would have been like most basic camp. Um, the funny thing about it was that this was a settlement. So it wasn't just convicts. It was convicts on. So convicts would be on one side of the beach in their, you know, calico tents. And then there was a quite there was a lot of gentry because they were settling this thing and the gentry were there to, to, to take land and, and own the land. So they had all these, they had much more, um, how should I say, resources. So they had proper tents and, and the comm- commandant was on the top of the, of, 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 of the hill there and you had to all report to him and there were a lot of soldiers around. So the convicts were being overseen. So on one side you had sort of the poor old convicts doing all the drudgery and all the hard work. And on the other side, you had all the all the others sort of cavorting and having a lovely time while everybody did the work around them. It was very much a class system. So you've got you've got this little little colony which echoes the sort of class system that, that you had in back in Britain. So it was very a very big drudge for people like uh, uh, William Buckley, um, and and not such a bad place not to be for you know sort of a, a an Arcadian wilderness uh, for for the gentry who had everything done for them. So in this time and place, there are convicts, gentry, as you've just said, uh, but also um, bush rangers. Can, can you explain what a bush ranger was? Yeah. What what happened was the bush rangers weren't there at that time. This is a very early in the in the Australia was settled in Sydney in 1788, and um, bush rangers didn't really come on that um, come on till maybe about the mid uh, 1810, 1811. What happened was a lot of a lot of the actual convicts were either fled, uh, but this this particular uh, settlement, there were no bush rangers because there were no white people around. It was just this colony, but you did, there were convicts who fled and who did who were capable and learned learned to live on the land. They mostly learned this from the Aboriginal people, uh, and they learned they watched the Aboriginal people, saw how they lived off the land, and the bush rangers came in probably seven or eight years after because then the convicts had either fled or they'd actually got their freedom and decided to become bush rangers anyway because they had no hope. Uh, so what happened, I should explain, I don't want to be, I don't want to get too much into this, but this particular settlement failed. So within three months of Buckley being there, uh, they decided to pack off and go to Tasmania, which is, I'm sure you know, is a little island south. So Buckley said, I don't want to go to Tasmania. I'm going to go and flee and I'm going to go into the woods and I'm going to try and make a life for myself alone. So he fled with six other people up up the peninsula and the other five dropped off until he was the only one alone. And there he was, completely alone in the wilderness, a 22-year-old guy with no bush skills practically at all, having to fend for himself and only what he thought were going to be aggressive Aboriginal people around him. I hope that gives the context. <laughs> Absolutely. So William Buckley, you've already mentioned his height. <laughs> He's an imposing character, and he played a pivotal, important role in the military. Yeah, he was what they actually called, as you, you rightly say, a pivot man. You can imagine the guy, he's one of those guys you see in the old sort of things of Napoleonic arm, you know, Napoleonic type, where a man would would turn right and the whole wing, he'd, wing the, he'd sort of wheel the entire um, line of men around him. So, yeah, he was imposing because he was six foot five and seven eighths, they, they would say. So he's basically six foot six, which I think is about 190 centimetres. But uh, he, he was a huge man because in those days, a, a tall man was around five foot seven. Um, uh, and uh, uh, that was pretty tall. Most guys were around five foot four, five foot five. Uh, at six foot five, he was gargantuan. But the thing about Buckley was he was he was a very much one of those gentle giants. Um, he, he was highly athletic, extremely strong, very capable athletically. Um, so he could run uh, for hours and hours, and he, he did such. Uh, when he when he fled from the settlement, he he ran for about three or four hours nonstop. There's no one could keep up with him. So yes, he was very strong, but always very 
kind and, and, and very gentle man and never did anybody any disservice that I, I ever heard of. It ends up being a pretty harrowing journey for him. His compatriots lose hope, turn around, go back. He continues on alone into the wilderness. What was his first contact like with the Aborigines? Yeah. Uh, yeah, he was he was lost, pretty much lost in the wilderness, and he was getting extremely desperate, and he decided to try and go back. And this was about three months after he'd actually fled from the convict, and he thought that he could go back around around, and 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 meet, go back to the colony and meet his fate, which he probably would have been whipped or put in the stocks or whatever. But on his way, he just started to lose. He just, it was winter, and he just started to lose power. He just had no more strength left. He got to a little place on an area called the Bellarine Peninsula, and he forded a stream. And really, that was the last of his last of his uh, of his strength. But what he had done just previously, he he'd found a grave, and on the grave was a spear. It was a spear of a warrior, and he he took it, knowing that he was desecrating the grave. But he took it, thinking, well, maybe he could possibly use it to hunt or just to, as a st- walking stick. So he was found by the Aboriginal people. I think it was three women found him half dead on the banks of a river with the spear of a of of a warrior they knew and he they kind of resuscitated him and they were screaming and wailing and all all kinds of they they couldn't they looked as if they couldn't believe that it was him and as if they knew him and he didn't really understand what why are these people getting so upset about me being here and it turns out and it's happened many times since that they believed that Buckley was that man who was in the grave, a guy called, a man they would they called Murungurk. The Aborigines believed that when you died, you went over the your spirit went over the seas, and some if you if you loved your country enough, your spirit would return. And they believed Buckley was Murungurk, the man in the man in the grave, returned because he had Murungurk's spear. Now you didn't have to look like Murungurk; you could just be tall, and they would still think that. It was him, but that was the evidence. And so you can imagine for them what this was like. They thought their lost person who had died, Murungurk, had now come back simply because he loved them so much. And they went, how can I say, they went nuts, they went crazy. They couldn't, it was like a man being resurrected. They believed Murungurk had come back to life to come back to see them. And so it was a very strange meeting for Buckley the first time because they were they were giving him everything he wanted. They were treating him with kid gloves. They were putting him by the fire. They were looking after them. They were giving him food. And Buckley had been three months in the wilderness with no one's help at all. And suddenly these people were so kind and gentle and friendly to him and he couldn't work out what was going on. So that was a quite funny, strange first meeting with the Aboriginal people. What year did this happen in? And, and what part of Australia did he find himself in? Right. So where he... he you, if you know the city of Melbourne, it's around Port Phillip Bay. So it's a big bay in the very southern part, southeast, the very southeastern corner of Australia. So he had gone past Melbourne to a place called Geelong. And we're talking about eight, we're now in 1804 because he'd been on the run or whatever you want to call it. He'd been in the wilderness for three months. Uh, they had arrived in 1803 and by 1804, three or four months in, uh, he was that was around about when he was found by the Aborigines in, in the Bel- around the Bellarine Peninsula. You'd have to look on it on a map, but it's a very southeastern corner of Australia that we're talking about here. Perfect. Thank you. Would you tell us about the indigenous people in Australia? Uh, were the Aborigines divided into tribes, clans? Yeah. What were the similarities amongst these, these clans, the differences? Yeah, there were, where he was around the Port Phillip area, there were five tribes. They actually called them the Kulin Nation. And they all, it's, you could call it, um, I thought, I don't think it's unlike, um, what the, the American Indians had. They had tribes, big, big tribes of probably several thousand. And various clans lived in various parts. And those, those clans knew that area and they'd lived in that area and you never leave left that well you, you did leave that hint that area to hunt but hunt and gather but you you never really left it as it were that was your home and those, all the clans knew exactly what part of the country they were in what part of the country they were that, that and so there would be a great knowledge between various clans and intertribal so when the water which was the tribe that he was with 
he belonged to the Barabul clan, which is an area in, in the south of the Wadawurrung land. But then he would live in – it, it gets it further subdivided down into bands. So he probably lived with a band that lived in a particular part. Uh, so it was very um, divided, um, but yet everybody knew each other. And they, everybody knew which clan you were in, uh, what tribe. And, and the, the Wadawurrung spoke the same language, but uh, just next to them was another tribe of a, or nation, if you like, um, another tribe that was – that spoke a very similar language. So the Kulin Nation, which was about five tribes, all all spoke a very similar language. So that they were sort of connected. So it's often there were marriage between tribe marriages between tribes. So they were, they were very well connected with their family, and everybody knew everybody's place. They knew that you were this person's uncle, you know this person's auntie. You you might have shared a grandfather, all that sort of thing. The Aboriginals were the kin was ex, extremely important to them, and they and they knew. Exactly who you were through your through your um, through your line through your ancestry, right. So this first meeting, he's lavished with food, grubs, water, very hungry, very grateful. I think you write that they even build a hut around him, but but he's still a little bit wary. How long does it take for him to ingratiate himself into the clan? I, I don't think it took very long because. He was taken to you got it here's the other funny thing he was taken by this by this clan that had met him to his actual family because you got to remember he's been resurrected so find he finds out now that he has a sister and he has a brother-in-law and uh, I think two nephews and a niece so they're all so they all believe that he is uh, you know the Emurengurk so they're treating him brilliantly. The problem for him is he didn't—he just didn't understand why that was happening. He—he he began to understand when, when, when he could begin to understand the language, and that would have taken a long time. It would have probably taken him a couple of years to, to master the language. Uh, but his big fear—it it was all this, this belief among convicts, and it was—it was told to them by the, the by the upper echelons that if, if you go into the wilderness, you will be eaten by cannibals. They just believed that everybody was a cannibal, and yet there's no actual evidence of Aboriginal people being cannibals and eating for eating sake. And yet this was just, this was the thing that Buckley feared. Every time he saw a fire, he thought he was going to be chucked in the fire and, eat, and ate, eaten. So, it, But he realised, I reckon, within two or three days that these people were not going to harm him. They cared about him. Why they cared about him, he couldn't work out. But he's being treated with kid gloves. And, I, and he began to ingratiate himself, I would say, very quickly. Uh, he, it was very clear that they, they wanted him and they wanted him to be there. Every time he used to leave camp and go and wash himself in the nearby river, they'd all be worried because he's been away for 10 minutes. Because here's the other funny thing. They, they, they believed he'd died. So they were treating him really well because they didn't want the man that had already died to die again. And so here's this funny situation, funny situation where they're treating him overly kindly to make sure that nothing goes wrong for him. <laughs> so Buckley is not allowed to fight, right? He, he's kept away when his clan fights other clans. That's right. Yeah, he, 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 he was never involved or says he was never involved in any form of uh, aggression between rival clans because they could have, they could have disputes or rival tribes. I mean, there was all kinds of disputes that could happen. Uh, and he was kept distinct from them. But apparently there were certain situations. He learned to use, he learned to hunt and he used, learned to use a spear as well, apparently as well as any of them. So there were situations where I believe he was threatened and, he, and being a six foot five guy, he said, don't mess with me, guys. Uh, I can, I can hold my own. And I think he could. Within a few years, he was very adept. Uh, whether he didn't actually take part in any fights or any in, in, interclan or intertribal fights, but he was pretty adept with the spear and he knew how to use everything. And he would be introduced by his own clan to members of other clans, right? Yeah, yeah. They they, they saw him, and he. You got to remember that the you got to remember that the uh, the Bush Telegraph, as they, they, they we call it here, I'm probably the same in America. The Bush Telegraph is extremely good among Aboriginal people. They would have heard about Murungurk coming back, and everybody in the entire nation would have heard. So I, I draw a scene there where I think I can't be 100 percent sure, but he describes it in 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 the source material that I used, uh, and. There was a great meeting of the of of all the tribes, um, and that's talking about the whole Kulin nation here. And he was kind of put in the centre, and everybody sort of 
looked at him for, for, for many minutes just to check whether they believed he was Burengurk or not. That's what he thinks. We don't know. But basically, they were checking him out. And in the end, they, they, he was accepted not just by his clan and his tribe, but by everybody in the entire – he was well known. He became – William Buckley became – you know, the, the guy who, the, the ghost who had come back and everybody knew who he was. There's no doubt that he was famous within the, the, this much larger nation around the whole Port Phillip area. And during his three plus decades with the tribe, he, he's married as well. Yeah, he, he did get married. I don't think it was a very happy marriage. He doesn't say a very big deal about it. He says that she went off with some other guy and he went, oh, look, I don't mind. You know, I don't, we didn't really care for each other that much anyway um so far as any other marriages there is i do mention a woman in there who claimed to be his wife we don't know because it's the the source material is very sketchy it's not very clear where he might have met her as for having kids it's 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 another one we don't know who the wives were we don't know the names of the kids Uh, i wrote in the book that um, he had two sons, and, and then there was another situation where a, a woman in the 1870s claimed to be his granddaughter. So we don't, we we just don't know who they were. But yes, he was married, but we don't think that that marriage, that official marriage that he talks about, made uh, created any children. I don't think that was the. I think he had children by other women, but who they were, we don't know. You know, I I got the sense while reading your book, he, he was kind of a sensitive guy. Yeah. There, there is this really poignant moment in the book where this family that's adopted him, that he loves so much, the brother-in-law is killed, right? That's right. Uh, would you mind telling that story? Yeah, sure. Um, it's hard to explain, but you have to understand the Aboriginal way of thinking, which I've only learnt myself while I write. What happens is if you're a far-off tribe, you're considered uh, a threat. So those tribes who are outside the 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 Kulin Nation, which is around the Port Phillip area, if you're beyond that area, you're considered an enemy. It's just the way it is. Uh, if they don't know you, if they don't have a linguistic uh, or or any kind of kinship with the other tribe, they're considered enemies. Now, what happened with Buckley is somebody from one of these tribes came to his tribe and they actually looked after him, which is surprising because they don't usually look after absolute foreigners, people outside the Kulin Nation, but they did. He, as I understand it, was bitten by a snake and he was given and was and was dead within a few days because the snakes in Australia, you may have heard, are very venomous. Uh, I think most snakes, you, you don't want to be you don't want to go too near them. But this man was he, he was uh, he was bitten by a snake and killed. Now, what happened was they gave him the full burial rights. They treated him really well. But then a foreign tribe blamed Buckley's tribe for what had been done. It didn't matter that he was bitten by a snake. The way they saw it was that sorcery from Buckley's tribe had actually influenced the snake to bite him. That's how they think think of it. Now, it's very strange because there's different cause and effect here. Um, so they went and they believed that the sorcery came from Buckley's uh, brother-in-law. So not only did they hunt down and kill Buckley's brother-in-law for, for the death by snake of their tribesmen, they killed his they killed uh, his wife and I believe uh, and there was one one of his one of his daughters I think well, I, I just can't remember exactly but anyway there was a revenge payback killing on Buckley's family from this foreign tribe and the funny thing about it was after it had all been done they said oh Mr Buckley they said Nuremberg would you like to come and join us and it was like they'd done business it was like it was a bit like a mafia killing we didn't do this it wasn't personal we, it was business it was like something they had to do. And Buckley just couldn't believe it. And he became very traumatized by this whole thing because what had his family done? Absolutely nothing. And yet they were killed for some strange reason related to sorcery. So these are the things that Buckley as a white man, he still retained some of his white men, white man cause and effect things. And he became estranged to some extent from the Aboriginal people for these kinds of things. He just never understood this kind of uh, thinking. And now a quick word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So while he is living with this tribe, there are changes happening, as you've already alluded to. Western civilization is encroaching on their lands. And one of the primary characters leading this charge is is John Batman. Yeah. uh, The bounty hunter from your title, The Ghost and the Bounty Hunter. 
Can you tell us about his background and his place in Australian history? Yeah, let me let me go back uh, as best as I can. Uh, Batman was a, he was born in Sydney, so he's from the main colony, the biggest colony. Um, he was he, he grew up. I believe he had a Presbyterian background, and his his father believed that there was a sort of egalitarianism that or Presbyterian egalitarianism that even people, the native people, which most people treated very badly were considered equals. So Batman lived and with Aboriginal, as he grew up, he lived and, and worked with Aboriginal people. So he, he saw them as kind of equals. Um, but you have to also understand there was another side of him. He had a very big ship on his shoulder because he was the first generation of Australians born in, in, in Australia. So he had British parents, but he was born in Australia. And he was, and they, they, he was what they call a currency lad. Uh, why they call them currency lad, I don't know. But they're the first generation, and they always looked down upon um, by any British settlers as sort of second-rate people um, uh, because they were they were actually native Australians in their own way. So he had a chip on his shoulder, and he was very ambitious. He was said in as an 18, 19 year old to have got a woman pregnant. Um, it was all hushed up. He went off to Tasmania to sort of because Tasmania was then becoming uh, a quite a quite a decent settlement, and he was able to get some land there. Now the thing about Batman, which made him very much different from all of the other people who were settling in Tasmania, um, was that he was a brilliant bushman because he knew the ways of the Aborigines. Now the Aborigines, of course, knew the land far better than white people, but Batman was different because he had lived and worked with them and knew how to live off the land. He, he got some land, but he also knew how to, to go bush and he knew how to forage and he was he was a native in that sense. So I tell the story of Batman. Batman started to work. See, so there's a thing about he was very ambitious. He at that time in the 1830s, uh, 1820s, I should say, he was uh, he was conscripted, so to speak, by the government to get rid of Aborigines because the Aborigines were threatening the settlers there. And of course, Batman was a brilliant bushman, so they needed a man like him. So he switched on the people he was supposedly his friends, the Aborigines. He basically switched on them and started hunting them. And, and he did it for the government because the government gave him that ability to do so and he would be rewarded for doing so. So it's not a very, it's not a very good story at all. Um, in the 1820s, Batman heard about Port Phillip where Buckley was. An explorer had been there. And because Tasmania, he thought, was overcrowded, and he wasn't given what he's due. He thought, I want to make a settlement in this virgin land across, just across the water. So Tasmania is just across the water from where Buckley is, just about a day sailing. Uh, but the government said, you know, you're not allowed to. There's no, we don't have a settlement there. You're not allowed to take land. But Batman dreamed and dreamed of going to, basically going to where Buckley was, water, water and land. And uh, the other thing about Batman is worth knowing is that by the 1830s it became clear that he was dying from syphilis. And in syphilis in those days was extremely debilitating. And by the mid 1830s, he's, he had, he had to put a, a bandana over his nose because his nose was being eaten away by the syphilis. Batman still had this dream and he wanted to take land in Port Phillip. So he just got on a boat. He said, if I don't do it now, I'll never do it. Got on a boat, still syphilitic, but still quite capable. He, the syphilis hadn't got to him at that point. And, and basically docked in, in Buckley's land, in the Wadarung country, and then went in search of the native elders to try and do a deal. And uh, that's where that the two stories converge. He's, he met some elders, and he did what he believed was a deal, which gave him some land there. Uh, I don't believe it was any kind of deal. I think the na native people, the, 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 the people said, understood that he wanted to stay there and they said, you can bring your family and you can, you can live there for some time. But they didn't actually know that they were doing a deal for hundreds of thousands of hectares of land. So Batman goes back to Tasmania and says, look, I'm the biggest landholder on the, on the, in, in, I've got 600,000 hectares, I think it was. And then everybody heard about it and everybody said, we've got to go and do this as well. So Batman was a start. And the next thing you know, Buckley meets some of the, the landing partner party, I should say, of Batman. And that's where the two, that's where Buckley first, after 32 years, meets white, white men all over again for the first time. I want to ask you about that meeting. But before we get to it, I'd like to ask you about Batman's 
reputation as a bounty hunter. We talk a lot about outlaws on this show. <laughs> yes. And Australia has more than its share of mythical outlaw characters. Yes. He captured two, a man named Jeffries and a man named Brady. Uh, would, would you tell us about them? Yeah, well, of course, Batman was, was before they called it, in, in Tasmania, before they decided they wanted to clear the country of, of, of all indigenous people, they had to clear the country of the bush rangers. Now, you were talking to me earlier about the bush rangers. They started to come into being around after about 1810, um, because by then, as I said, some of them, many had escaped. They'd gone bush. They knew enough about the land to live off it. And there were people like Brady and, and Jeffrey. They're both very different. Now, Brady was a gentleman type, uh, and he was probably the most brilliant, except he never he, – he was most brilliant, and he knew how to, to work – uh, the, the land as well as anyone and, and, and evade everybody. There were convict people, convicts that went out to find him, but he was just too smart and too quick. Um, it turned out that he was injured in the leg and by sheer chance, Batman was out trying to find him and he moved towards Batman at, at this particular time in, the 18, in 1824, 1825. And Batman, he found his scent, basically, and Batman was every bit as good a bushman as Brady. So it was a two great bushmen. There was... There was a bush ranger, uh, Brady, who knew how to handle himself in the Australian wilderness. And then there was uh, Batman, the the bounty hunter. So first he was a bounty hunter for bush rangers. Let's let's make this clear. And then later became a bounty hunter for Aborigines. Because he was such a brilliant tracker, he eventually came and and found Brady. And Brady knew that Brady knew exactly who Batman was. Batman, and and he just gave himself up because he knew that there's no way half he he was injured that he could escape from such such a brilliant bushman like like. uh, Batman and uh, eventually Brady was taken in and was hanged and but much to the very sadness of because he was seen as a great, as a great savior as the man who defied uh, the colonial rule um, Brady was very much Matthew Brady was very much beloved um, but Batman got the best of him I'm afraid so Brady was the much beloved outlaw and Jeffries you've already talked a, a bit about cannibalism and the myth that Aborigines practiced it not true but this bush ranger named Jeffries was allegedly a cannibal. Yeah, yeah, no, there were a few can- white. If, if there were any cannibals in Australia, they were white, and they were Europeans. There's a very famous story about Alexander Pierce, another convict who escaped and became a kind of bush ranger in a way. Yes, he was a bush ranger. He got he left the western side of Tasmania and got to Hobart, or which is the on the eastern side. And the only way he survived, because nobody else has survived, was Along the way, he he and six others, basically, they all ate each other, so to speak. And he was the last man standing. He was the last man who ate the, the sixth person, who, because he was able to do that, uh, made it to the other side. And we're talking about some of the most tough country on earth. And he only made it through because he could eat the others. It was a terrible story. Jeffries, I don't know too much about his cannibalism Except that he uh, he was said to have eaten other other men. <laughs> he he claimed it. He said he did. And of course, this was abhorrent to everybody. Uh, Jeffries was a degenerate. I mean, not only was he a cannibal, he raped women, uh, he killed people. He he was the absolute antithesis of of Brady, who was the uh, the Dick Turpin of Australia, if you like, the the sort of highwayman type gentleman. Um, you know, he was the lowest of the lows, and and, and apparently he, I read somewhere that that um, Jeffries was in Brady's group, and Brady just, just expelled him because the guy was a total gen- degenerate. Uh, I think we're talking about real rough character in Jeffries. Interesting. So back to Buckley, it's a moving moment when he realizes that the white men are coming. Um, he'd lived so long in blissful ignorance. And he'd even forgotten how to speak English. Yeah, that's true. When he got to the camp in 1835, when they actually, when when white man actually came back to settle, he arrived in the camp and he he sat there at the end of the camp. This huge, imposing, six foot five white guy, clearly a white guy, but dressed as an Aboriginal and obviously knew the Aboriginal ways. Uh, he'd forgotten how to speak English. He he. I should say that he knew that well, there were white men, there were sealers and whalers on the coast, but they treated the Aboriginal people appallingly as a whole, and he didn't want to be part of them. They're just not 
people he wanted to be part of. He was a gentle guy who loved his people by this time. By the 1835, he was a, he was a Wadawurrung who had had a past as a white. He had more years as an Aboriginal than he had as a white. So he enters the camp and they just couldn't believe what they were seeing. I mean, where did this white man just step out from? Where did he come from? And he's gigantic to boot. And so they start asking him questions. And eventually he remembers the, uh, somebody gives him a piece of bread and, and, and he said it was like a cloud passing over my bread, my brain. And he said the word bread, and that was his first English word in 32 years. And then I think it started to come back. After a few weeks, he could probably speak reasonable English and tell his story. Uh, it would have taken a little while, but it all came back after a while. He obviously now has to walk a fine line, do a balancing act between both sides. Yes, that's exactly right. He has to be kind of an agent for both, but an, an agent for neither. So he's playing a double game here. Um, he wants to help the white people, and there's a reason for that. He knew that he was going to be seen as an escaped convict and could be sent off because he knew that he had to ingratiate himself with the white people who had come because if he didn't, it would be, you know, he wouldn't get his freedom because technically he was still an escaped convict, even 32 years later. So he wanted a pardon. So that's why he had to be mates or friends with the white people. And I think because he wanted to be, he, didn't, he was a generous guy who just simply wanted to, he didn't want any trouble. He didn't want, he was known as a peacemaker. And he, he probably liked the, the, the white guys that he met. Batman's people that he'd left there uh, were probably nice to him and they looked after him and they fed him and they looked after him. At the same time, he was now a Wadawurrung person. Now, the Wadawurrung saw these white people encamped on their land. Now, there's a very important, important part of the story that you cannot just walk onto Aboriginal land and say, hello, how are you? You have to give, give gifts. If they were going to stay on the land, they had to give something back. And of course, they did try to give gifts, but it wasn't enough. They were just a very small enclave of eight people. And then more water were on, came and said, well, where's our, where, where's our stuff? So Buckley had to step in. Buckley stepped in and said, don't kill these people. Don't kill them. Don't you realize these white people they're coming back. There's going to be another ship, and uh, if you kill them now, you won't get any of the, all, all, the, all the gifts that they're going to be bringing for you. And they go, oh, yes, of course, if we kill them now. then." So he's playing this game where he's, he's playing each other off. So he's telling the white people that it's no problem, you're okay, you can stay here, we, we don't mind, there's it's no problems at all. And then he's telling, telling the, the, the indigenous people, his, his family and his, and his fellow tribesmen, don't kill them now, because if you do, you won't be getting anything from them. So he managed to keep them apart. And actually, they get on okay. Um, within the white camp were, were five Aboriginal people from Sydney. Now, these would have been seen as foreigners. Yet, funnily enough, the Wadawurrung actually got on really well with them because they corroborated together. They went out kangaroo hunting. So the whole point was that the white camp ingratiated themselves as best they could with the with the water room people, but there was always a threat coming over them that if they didn't give anything back, they could be killed. Uh, but luckily, another ship came and they were given all kinds of trinkets and and they loved axes. The Aboriginal people loved it. They they had they had multiple uses for white man's axes because it could be used to cut trees, it could be used to skin skin animals. It was the best piece of equipment they'd ever seen, and they were crazy about axes. And of course, the white people realised that they, they wanted their axes, so they brought them by the by the truckload, uh, and that ingratiated themselves with the local people. How long is Buckley able to keep peace between the two sides? I think roughly about. I, I don't remember exact, but. I think he, he kept the peace between the two sides for about four to five weeks until another ship came. And, and, and you can imagine his relief when the ship came because then, of course, the Aborigines saw these, these wonderful gifts coming towards them and they felt quite about, all about killing the, the, the white people that were, that were in, at the camp. But Buckley also realised that the more white people came, the more they would be encroaching on Aboriginal land. So he knew what was happening here. He knew that the more ships came and gave the Aboriginal people all these things that they wanted, the more the white people could have a, a foothold on this piece of land. And he knew that what was coming, he knew exactly that more ships, more whites, equals more appropriation of Aboriginal land. He knew there was going to be a problem down the line. Was he able to help soften that blow? I think he did. He did for a, for a year or so. More white people came. He was used as the interpreter. They were given more gifts. There was they, the, the camp moved from into what is now Melbourne, and that's where Melbourne pretty much started. 
Batman arrived and a few others and some more whites arrived. But at this point in the in 1835, 1836, uh, there were still very few white people. And because the white people were, were freely giving at this very early juncture, at this very early time, they were giving in 1835, 1836, they were, they were giving back a lot to the average. So it was a very fair society for about a year, year and a half. First year, year and a half of the, of the settlement of Melbourne was a very peaceable one. Uh, the white people lived with the black people. Uh, there was very much mixing. Uh, there was an equality there. There was nobody trying to usurp the other people's land. It was it, it worked quite well. And Buckley was the sort of instrument there. He was the only one who spoke the language. So he, whenever white men needed to tell the, you know, their Aboriginal people certain things, he could do that, and then they would relay. And he would they would relay their thoughts back via Buckley. So he became the go between. He became very important to both sides to get their messages and their views across. What happened after a year or so? Uh, why did things change? Well, I, I say it in the book, my but you can't exactly find a turning point. When did things start to turn sour? I think it happened when a man called Charles Franks was killed. I think that's about mid-1836, sometime around 1836. He was a landowner. Of course, there were... By that time, there were the first landowners coming and taking the land. And, of course, this was they were dispossessing the Aboriginal people of the land, and that was causing rancour in itself. But it wasn't causing serious rancour because many of the landowners realised, well, we better give the Aboriginal people, you know, access to their own land. It was working OK, but then Franks was killed. And the reason we don't know why Franks was killed by the, by the native people, except it was believed that he was either giving them poisoned food, he hated them, and he was giving them, or he was shooting them. So at some point he was killed. Now that caused an uproar because Franks wasn't your everyday convict. He wasn't your everyday person. He was a landowner and much liked. And the, the landlords, if you like, if you want to call them that, the settlers said, if they can kill him, they can kill us. So they went out on a reprisal and they took 12, 15 men out to repri for a reprisal killing for the men who killed Franks. And they, it's believed they killed it said they killed 12, but many believe that they killed maybe upwards of 30 Aboriginal people. And that's when things started to really turn sour. And then the reprisals just kept coming. And from then on, it, uh, it, was, it was not a nice place to be. And Buckley, of course, saw all this happening. He, he feared that this would happen in the first place. And suddenly it was all coming unstuck by late 1836, early 1837. So within two years, things had turned pretty sour. Uh, between the native people and the the uh, the newcomers, the invaders, so to speak. How long does it take for the Aboriginal people in this area to be driven out, assimilated, or killed? Uh, what's the timeline here? People here get it slightly wrong. They think that people went out in the white people went out in droves and hunting parties, and like like John Batman did in in Tasmania, and go off and kill. And there were some of that, but what really destroyed the Aboriginal culture was the fact that they were bring, the white men were bringing in sheep and the sheep would eat all the native food and the most um, important native food, almost a staple, more than kangaroo, more than any possums, more than the wildlife, was a thing called myrnong and myrnong was like was a yam and it's a very funny, interesting thing that at the very, very same time that the myrnong, that the sheep were eating they, the sheep were taking all the land and they were eating the roots of the Murnong. And within, they, say, they reckon within three or four years, millions of acres of Murnong had just been eaten up by the sheep. Because by this time, it was perfect grazing land. The sheep, there was maybe several hundred thousand sheep by the, by the late 1830s. So the people were started to, sh to spear sheep because they couldn't get their native foods. It was being eaten up. So the real killer, if you like, of Aborigines was not the fact it was not white men going out and hunting them. It was the fact that their native foods were decimated. Because So that, that meant that once they were not allowed onto their own lands and their own lands were being eaten up but anyway, they, the only place they could get food was Melbourne. So so many tribal people encroached on Melbourne and then the Melbourne people said, we don't want, we don't want Aborigines here. Make sure they don't come in. So suddenly these people became not even dispossessed of their land. They weren't even allowed into, their, into, the, into the main settlement. And then, of course, there was disease. Many of them got syphilis and all kinds of venereal disease, but also smallpox and white men gave them all kinds of diseases. So these people were being decimated, but not by killing per se, although that happened. I'm not saying that there weren't killings out, out there. There were some terrible reprisals. But they gave back too. They killed white people too. You know, 
there was there, there was an evenness, but the white men, of course, had more superior technology. But the real killer, the real destroyer of people was the desecration of their lands, which took away the food source. And, of course, all the all the diseases that that white man brought with him. So that combination, which is too powerful, they could not survive it. Yeah, it uh, reminds me a bit of the, the Plains Indians in America. Uh, millions of, of buffalo wiped out by Western expansion, uh, their primary source of food and, and material for, for making necessities. Here's the funny thing I was, I just, I was going to allude to. Uh, the funny thing is that at the very same time that the Aboriginals were suffering uh, a yam famine was the very same time as the Irish potato famine. And for all the same reasons, once you've taken the main form of sustenance, as the British did to the Irish, and as the British or the Australians or whatever you want to call it, did to the Aborigines, they've got no hope. And look what happened to Ireland. It was became impoverished. Uh, they all came. They all left Ireland and went to the United States or Australia. Many of them. Uh, it happened to. It's not just a thing that happened to um, <laughs> to, to indigenous people. It happened to the Irish as well. To, in, well they, they they were starved of their own food sources. So what becomes of William Buckley? Uh, Buckley became, I think he became fed up in the end. He watched as his people were being, uh, you know, driven off and deracinated. And uh, he noted that, that the many thousands he knew when he first started out were being, were no longer many thousands. There were no kids being, children being born. It was a very rough time. And he didn't want to be the mouthpiece of the white man anymore. You see, if you became the white the white man was becoming increasingly more aggressive. So the, the correspondence via Buckley was basically an aggressive one towards the very people he was he, he felt he was part of. So they thought of him, the, the Aboriginal people were beginning to think of him as, as a turncoat, as a betrayer, as a traitor. Uh, they didn't trust him anymore. And the white men, of course, thought that uh, Buckley was half savage. They used to say he was a savage and he had no brains. And, of course, he was neither of those things. But he was half of something, and I think he just got fed up. So he said, I've had enough of this. He'd been given his freedom. He'd been, in, in the interim, he'd been given his pardon. And, you know, after that, he said, I'm going to Tasmania where I'm, where I'm, I'm a nobody. And had it, had the next 20 years of his life had a very, very quiet life. So not a great deal happened, except that uh, the book was written by, he, he finally did his book about what happened to him in the 1850s, only, I think, three or four years before he died. And it became a sensation, that book. It was called you know, William Buckley, uh, The Wild White Man and His Adventures, something along those lines. Um, but that's the source book from which we know a lot of what happened to Buckley. It's not completely accurate. There are other, I had to use for this book, other other sources of material because some of the parts of the book were just exaggerated, I think. Um, but yes, he had a very quiet life. And in the end, um, he was he became a sort of courier and he was... Uh, I think he was in his 70s. He was quite an old man when he was on, on, on a gig, which is just a little little stage stagecoach, um, and he was delivering some parcels. And that stagecoach, the gig we call it, overturned and he broke his back. And I think within two or three months, he was a very old guy by this. He was in his 70s. He he died very just a very uh, lonely death. He had a wife, uh, um, and he sort of died ig ig ignominiously. Um, but people remembered him, and he became quite a legend. And as I said at the very beginning, I think people began to use the expression, you've got Buckley's. Even though he died a sort of lonely death, and um, he became part of the Australian idiomatic speech, and uh, at least something survived of him. <laughs> yes, for sure. So this is a great book. Uh, I just want to briefly mention, though, another great book of yours, The Ship That Never Was. Yes. Wish we had time to do that one, too. W would you summarize that one for us? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the first, I, I seem to have become the convict writer. I don't know why I didn't set out that way to be. Ah, we love um, that here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely think my next book's not going to be about a convict. It's just, it's just the way it happened. But my first book, The Ship That Never Was, I'll try to give it in a, you know, I, I should try and give an ele elevator pitch, but it's, it's about uh, another convict who was sent down to Tasmania. He went to a place called Macquarie Harbour, which is where they sent all the, the worst recalcitrants. He tried to escape at least seven or eight times from this place and failed, but luckily fell in with a crew who, when they were abandoning that particular settlement in the 1830s, he fell in with a crew and there was a very smart guy. He said, 
there's one last ship going out from this thing and we're going to take it and we're going to sail it. And uh, long story cut short, James Porter, the main man, he and uh, eight other, nine other guys steal the boat and sail it all the way to Chile. Can you believe it? They sail it across the Pacific, across the Southern Ocean, and, and they took it all the way. So this is a bun- bunch of motley crew of sailors. And this is absolutely true. They got, took this last, last um, brig that came out of this settlement and they took it all the way to Chile and they became quite, quite famous in Chile. Uh, and the British said, we can't have this. We've got to go after them. And the story is about what happened then. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Perfect, perfect. Well, people can buy your book on Amazon, I know. Um, I didn't check to see if it's out in paperback here in the States. Um, I got the ebook version. I think, I think, I think you can get it, and don't quote me on this. I think it's, it's, you can get it at, at Barnes and Noble in the U.S. as a, as a paperback. So, but it's definitely an ebook. You can definitely get the ebook. But uh, my, the ship that ever was, you can get it as a paperback. I know that. Uh, whether that the Ghost and the Bounty Hunter, my second book, is available, I'm fairly sure. Uh, I'd have to check. You'd have to check that. Uh, but it's definitely only in the U.S. as an ebook. But you could buy it and have it shipped out all the way from Australia, but that's probably very expensive. <laughs> sure, sure. But I do hope uh, my American friends can get a chance to read a bit about the Australian history. It, it, it's it's very there's a very rich history. It's worth worth reading. Absolutely. Well, well, thank you so much for your time today. It's a it's been a pleasure, Eric, and I, I'm really really glad that I'm speaking to somebody in the U.S. because I'm you know it's totally different, and I have to uh, it's a different different way of doing things, but I really enjoyed it. Well, I appreciate it as well. Again, I have been speaking to Adam Courtney. He is the author of The Ghost and the Bounty Hunter. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobweb corner of the world. Please, I hope you're staying safe. Please wash your hands. Please keep your distance. It helps us all in the long run and have the safest of tomorrows.